My name is Ronnie. They call me Sir Sonic. I grew up around here, North Shore, home of the Mustangs. At a, at a young age, I was raised in a, in a house with a single mother with no father. I was abused as a little kid, drugged through the dirt out here on these same streets. By the age of nine, I was sent to my grandma's for a little bit. Got kicked out of the old Missouri County, had to come back out here to the east. By then, I'd already got a taste of the bad life. I started hanging with older kids. Then I started with my brother's friends. Started getting tattoos and drinking. I started smoking weed. I started drinking beer on the regular. By the age of 12, I started seeing that my brother started selling drugs. About two or three exes down right there in Seven Ward on Plymouth. Next thing you know, he got killed for selling drugs in the wrong part of town. I had a 380 with me, put about eight or nine bullets in it. So I wasn't even sweating nothing at all. I was a runaway for two days. I was living in the streets, sleeping in the woods a little bit in between Jacinto City and Galena Park. I went to school. Everybody was saying, don't go to school. They said, oh, you know, they're going to jump you if you go to school too. I didn't even come home to see my brother's funeral. Four days went by. My mom, when I got home, she opened the door. She started cooking. She said, uh, you'll always be able to eat here. There ain't no more love here for you because you're going down the same path your brother went down. And I know now you ain't going to do no, nothing different. So I'll, I'll be danged if you break my heart, she said. So, you know, I did one of the worst things ever. I threw something at my mom. I said I hated her and I caught ghosts. I got up out of there. You know, we got into the back of the school. There was a bunch of people met back there. They thought they were going to jump me. I had something else. I busted off a couple of shots. I shot three people. One died. Ran away from school. Hid the gun in the woods. Stayed there. Two days later, I get home. By the fourth day, I'm at my mom's house. Cause she had already heard what was going on and she was really, really feeling bad. At 12, I'm sitting in jail facing a murder charge. Man, it's one of the worst things ever was told to me. A psychologist came and they told me, man, you already committed murder. You can't get into heaven. Don't you at least want to be honest and tell us the truth? So I'm like, now, nah. you know, everybody says don't talk to the laws. Don't talk to the so-called white people. And don't be a rat. So I ain't tell nobody nothing. I went back to my cell, I started reading this little book they had in their Bible. <laughs> it's the only book they gave you. It said in the Old Testament, if you commit murder, the punishment for murder was death. So I was like, wow, I'll never be able to get into heaven. So I might as well just be the best at being the devil's number one that I can be. As soon as I got found guilty and sentenced to 21 years, I started pushing hard to do the devil's work. I started pushing hard to be this ultimate gangster, this, this person that grew up in the streets that was going to make it no matter what. Ended up in the penitentiary at 15 years old. 15 years old, I hit Clemens Unit. At Clemens Unit, I became Hugh Stone. I started, started blasting, Thongo Blast gang members. I started fighting just to make it every day, to build my hand, to, to make a name for myself so people would stand out my way. As I started doing that, everybody was patting me on the back. It gave me a quick opportunity to sell drugs. I started just making my money right here in these streets, right here in Cloverleaf. About two years passed, doing a lot of things, kidnapping, drug running, turning people into prostitutes, taking families out of their house and turning their lives upside down. 99 comes around, December 5th of 1999. Little did I know about the feds. The DEA's chasing me right up and down I-10 right here. For an hour and a half, they chased me all around the neighborhoods, through other neighborhoods, all the way until I got back over here on Wallaceville, and they wrecked into me and they busted me. I didn't know my best homeboy right here in this neighborhood set me up. They sentenced me to 72 months, and the federal system turned into nine years and four months. Nine years and four months turned into 12 years, 11 years and six to eight months, exactly. I ended up walking around to some of the worst prisons in the whole United States. I started in Beaumont. In Beaumont, I had riots with California. From them riots in California, they sent me to Oklahoma to the Federal Transfer Center in the Con Air. From there, I went to Pollock, Louisiana. When I got there, it was a United States prison. It's a lot different than being in a TDC prison because that's what Thongo, Hugh Stone, was originated for, Texas Department of Corrections. Not to be outside of Texas and in other parts of the United States, but to be for Texas. So now I'm walking 
in Polak, Louisiana, which is outside of Texas. So I was one of the first seven to get there. I was one of the only two to make it through there. We ended up getting into riots after we got deep. We became 100 deep there. We got into riots there with the Texas Seneca gang. They transferred me from there and they pushed me to Oklahoma again. From Oklahoma, I went to Lewisburg. From Lewisburg, I went to Leavenworth. Kansas City, Kansas, Leavenworth Penitentiary. First huge stone ever to step foot on that yard. First huge stone to ever go to Indiana. The first huge stone ever to go to, to a level seven death row penitentiary where I was in Indiana, in Indianapolis. It's called Terrell Hood. From Terrell Hood, they transferred me to Victorville, California, home of Crips and Bloods. Thought they would never see a huge stone. I was the first to walk out there and put my life on the line. The first one stabbed somebody on the yard. I got sent to Florence, Colorado, the Alcatraz of the Rockies. It's the worst of the worst. It's a maximum facility penitentiary. You got people like Larry Hoover and them underground. You got, you got the head gang members there are walking. Everybody there is a killer. Three people a day get stabbed. The warden, when you're coming in, introduces you like that. Raise your hand if you need some help. Raise your hand if you need some protection. If you think you can make it, it's sink or swim out of here. All I ask is you don't put no steel in my officers. Don't stab an officer here. You, we, we, we are, we're firmly understood that the gangs govern, that you will govern yourself here. If you don't got your paperwork, if you a rat or a check-in, you don't walk with these yards. It's a violent yard. You clean the blood up, and two hours later, you resume normal and keep pushing on the yard. So I did what I did. I opened it up. I blessed my homies' game. I brought them in. We walked. I walked off that penitentiary, too, with my head up. I came home, got to a halfway house, went right back to selling drugs. I wasn't even 14 days out. I'm already selling dope again. I got busted a couple of streets down on Corpus Christi. For an aggravated robbery. I got convicted for something I didn't do. Wouldn't, who would have thought of that? Aggravated robbery. So now I'm at the 20-year mark. That's when my son, his friend, committed suicide. So he stopped going to church. He started selling drugs. That already was hurting me the whole time. I had already had it in my head that I was glad I wasn't in my kid's life because I might have messed them up even worse. Their mamas would take care of them. The thing is, two weeks later go by, my son's mom's dies. Wow. The chaplaincy department calls me. I start thinking, man, what have I really did in my life? I got five kids and a daughter on the way at this time. And I'm sitting in here for something I didn't do. And, my, my, and I'm starting to see that my kids are suffering. So now I'm trying to figure out... I'm, I'm reaching out. I'm trying to figure out anything. The, chap the chaplains called me upstairs. They said, man, let me talk to you about God. I said, man, I don't, I don't talk to God, me and God. You know what I'm saying? I got a murder case when I was young. You don't even love me like this. The Jews like, man, who told you that? I start telling them. He starts saying, man, I said, man, don't you know who I am? I ain't trying to hear this God stuff. He says, I know who they say you are, but who does God say you are? I'm like, huh? Well, I ain't really trying to hear that, homie. I'm out of here. Sure enough, I bail out. When I'm leaving out, he says, man, before you go, let me uh, ask you what the words game over me to. He goes, I'll tell you what. Go outside and ask them in the office what the words game over me to. I went out there and I did. And I said, man, does anybody know what the words game over me? They said, yeah. The next person he would disciple would be a person with the words game over on me. And all he could remember was that he seen a coffin. And inside the coffin was somebody in a black suit and a white shirt with a black tie. And that the person was dead and everybody was standing around him and saying, you know what, he was a good man, he was a great man, he could have been a lot more. But instead, it was too late. So I started reading the Bible a little more. I, I started learning about who Saul was, a persecutor of Christians. How he became Paul through the will of God, Saul became a great man. Because all the years that I stayed gangbanging, all the years that I was telling everybody said they loved me for selling drugs and riding with them with these cars and rims and women and sharing things, I still had a boy.
And now, by being able to apply myself and dig into the Bible, I was feeling this void. Little did I know that I was going to get a chance to share it out here like that. And I, and I, and I won at trial and got, and got my case dismissed, got set free, got come out here, joined up with some people. The same people that was walking in these prisons talking to me, I was out there. I came out here and I started walking it out. I thought I was really strong, but I fell again. I lost my wife. I lost my kids because I made another mistake and everybody was tired of seeing me making mistakes. When I reached out and I cried, Jesus was there and I focused on him and nobody else was around but God. And then I came back out. The same people that was in there, that was, that was account of my accountability partners holding it down with me, Pyrex, my God brother, Trey Nine, Hip Hop Hope, All Eyes On Me, Missionary Minded. You know, I hooked up with them because I said, man, I got to dig deep. I got to get in here. I got to get in these streets. I got to push hard for God. I got to knock on doors. I got to tell somebody my story. And I can't do it on my own. I need a band of Christians that are going to ride tough with me the same way that they was. I had a team of, uh, of dudes willing to drag me down, willing to, to hurt me. Only difference is now I got a great team of, of Christian brothers that are involved with ministry that ain't scared to knock on the door with me and tell somebody something positive. Man, all glory to God, because God's working through me, through the old things, and he's taking my mess and turned it into such a powerful message out here. Going from schools, ministries, calling. You know, come share your testimony, sign it. Not to glorify your bed, but to show what God's doing in your life. You know what I'm saying? So I have been. I, I, I've seen young men come to Christ, and I even got to, got to uh, feel the joy of being able to baptize a young man. You know what I'm saying? What more better blessings than to say that you're saving lives after you done took so many. And I'm happy to be home now, you know, and I'm still working on a lot of things. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean it's, e it is easy. You know, I'm still building my family back. I'm still, I'm still trying to reconcile things. And I pray to God every day for restoration. Man, right here where I'm at in this point in this in my life, you know, I'm just excited to be with God. You know, I ain't gonna lie to you, man. I got some tears in my eyes because just talking right now has made me realize that all things are created new in the Lord. And when I'm at my weakest, God's at His strongest. You know what? And I'm and I'm pushing out here. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay working. I'm gonna stay with the job. I'm gonna stay ten toes down as a Christian man out here because I love God. And I love my family. And I'm going to be a father that succeeds to one day. My kids say, man, that's our daddy right there, man. Amen. And now I'm home. And I'm pushing forward. And I just want to tell you, man, God has a plan for everybody. Everybody. Even the ones that look like me. I got, got BB and some bullets. I got nine wounds and ten tools up. Everything. But man, God loves me. And I know today if I die, I'm going to heaven. I love that man. Lord, we give you all the praise, and we thank you for this day. We need you for everything, so we ask in Jesus' name. You've been with me all the way, that is why to you I pray. I need you for everything, so I ask in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you all the praise.